call it cosmic eschatology, two weeks ago. And last Sunday, we moved on to personal eschatology, where we talked about the end for individuals. So in fact, um, how we end our lives and transition into eternity. And today we come to the last seminar of, this, of the series. But you might find the title a little interesting or maybe even not consistent because it says on your bulletin, comedy or tragedy. Now, when I say comedy, I don't refer to those comedies where you go and laugh uh, when someone stands up and say funny things or does um, funny things. But comedy is a kind of genre in literary, and it is the opposite of tragedy. Tragedy is a story with sad ending, and comedy is a story with happy ending. And those two are the, the two different endings that you'll find in this passage that we have just seen. You have on one hand the people who are regarded or referred to as the sheep on the right hand side of the Lord who come into the eternal kingdom of God and their ending is happy ending. But on the other hand, there are these people who are referred to as the goat and they are gathered and thrown into the everlasting punishment. And I remind you that these basically refer to or include all people in this world, including us. So it is as if the Lord comes into this building and divides us into sheep and goats, some into everlasting life, some into everlasting damnation, some with happy ending, some with sad, tragic ending. And that's what we'd like to have a look at today. But for the benefit of those of you who perhaps did not come or could not come to the previous sessions, I'll give you a little bit of summary, a um, little bit of revision, and then continue on with our story. But as I thought about eschatology or the end times, basically we talked about on the first Sunday a whole lot of destructions. The destruction of the world. You might remember the seven trumpets the plagues of the seven seals and seven bowls. And the world is going through terrible tribulation and destruction. Uh, I can't remember all those um, plagues, 21 of them altogether, 777. Seven, seven. But you would recall that the, the rivers and the ocean is turning into blood. And one third of mankind are dying. All the creatures in the ocean are dying. And even the, the beasts in the field, the birds, including humankind, almost all of them are basically dying because of some terrible judgment. There's the fire and brimstone and smoke. It seems like that there are some terrible wars happening and people are killing each other, perhaps using some weapons such as nuclear weapons that we know of, and perhaps because of some cosmic um, things that happen, like stars falling from the sky, um, stars losing um, it's light, but on the one hand, the sun is um, shining so hot that it is burning people on earth. And those were the basic destructions that would happen in the end times. And then last week, we looked, looked at the personal eschatology, and this is to do with destruction of human life, where people die. And we know that we will all die, either through accidents or sickness or illness or old age, we all die. And we also so from the Bible, and the reason why we die is because, not because of sins or disease or physical ailments, but it is because of sin. Now we will have to get in more detail about that very point, but we die because of sin. Sin came, and death came, and death spread to all men. And therefore, if you know that you will die, however long you, you might live, if you know that you'll, you're going to die, that, that's proof that you are a sinner. And we'll also see that why the Bible says that everybody is a sinner from birth. But in any case, we all have our own eschatology, and that is not the end. We have, in a way, physical destruction, but we move on to eternity. And as we have seen today, some into everlasting life and some into everlasting damnation. And because this death is a very fearful thing for everybody, I mean, no one wants to die, and it's, it's a very unpleasant topic to talk about, um, and people try to prepare for death, but there's no way they can escape, and still it is unpleasant, just because you've prepared for your own funeral, maybe even took out some life insurance and made sure that your children are all looked after, even though you, you pass away, it doesn't make you feel any better. 
Because death itself is a very fearful thing for yourself. I mean, all the other people might benefit through your death, but what about you? You know, what about me? There's really not much you can prepare for your own death other than to heed to the words that we have from the Bible. If you look at history, there have been some interesting people who try to avert death, who try to live um, without seeing death. And that has been a kind of a very um, um, enigmatic um, riddle that people have been trying to solve over the years. You know, they try to live long, they try to live a healthy life, and they even try to live forever. And you might have perhaps read some stories, novels, or maybe even seen some movies where some people try to live forever through all kinds of strange means, whether it's sorcery or medical treatment or medical means or some kind of magic. Uh, people try to, to live as long as they can. You might recall a Chinese emperor, Chinese Qin or Qin, I think, Q-I-N. You know, he tried to live forever. He sent delegates and soldiers all over the world to, to find this herb that could make him live forever, uh, to give him immortality. But tragically, he died not even before he turned 50. You might even recall in our modern times, North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung, a couple of generations before us, now, he had a whole laboratory built for his long life and hundreds of scientists dedicated to, to research and to invent these medicines and health foods to, that, that could actually make him live a long time. But he's dead. He's long gone. No one can cheat death. No one can escape from death. We know that everybody dies. Every person. And that's personal eschatology. We all face that. But instead of looking at these places, whether it's medicine or science or magic or sorcery or religion, we really need to look at the Bible and see if the Bible tells us any way to escape death. Or maybe uh, not, not so much to escape death, but to conquer death. Now, that would be a better term, to conquer death. And indeed, the Bible tells us how that is possible. And in that sense, the Bible is not just a religious book. It's not a moral code. It is not just a history book, although it is a history book, contains a lot of history. It is the living word from God. If you compare it to a medicine, it's like a medicine that can give you eternal life. If you compare it to water, it is like living water that Jesus mentioned in chapter 4, John's Gospel, that could give you everlasting life. When you have doctors and you have pharmacists and all these health food um, specialists, nutritionists that you can go to to improve the quality of your life. And they can perhaps even prolong your days on earth. But none of them can give you eternity or eternal life, but the Bible does. And that's what we'd like to examine today. Before we go into those topics, let me give you a little bit of rev revision of what we've studied. Now the Bible, as we saw, is a book that contains the history of mankind as God ordained. Now that is the truth about the world, including not only the beginning, but the end as well. Cosmic eschatology, there was the creation there is the eschatology, the end times. Also, the Bible is the God's plan for mankind, which we can say um, it's the truth about the individual. It's what, what happens to you, what happens to me, not only in this world, but after we go through death. So the Bible tells us about the world. It tells about the individual persons. We also looked at... Um, basically um, the history of mankind in a kind of quick chart. Now this is from our seminar session one. Um, it is basically a timeline that's revealed through the Bible. Now when Jesus came, you can say that when he died on the cross and ascended into heaven through the resurrection, the church on earth started. And that's the period in which we live now. But that will come to an end. Uh, this is a little bit of a fast forward for those of you who were away, but you know, we will have an event called rapture. And this is where all churches are taken up to heaven, 
to meet the Lord in the air. We saw that from, say, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, Philippians chapter 3, those verses talk about the rapture of the church that are taken to heaven after the church on earth period. Now this church that's raptured up goes through what's known as the judgment seat of Christ where we are given reward and glory for all the work that we've done. It's not judgment for hell, but it is basically a kind of giving account of our lives and receiving all the glory and reward for what we've done for the Lord. Now also the Bible says that's like the marriage of the Lamb or the marriage supper or marriage feast of the Lamb. That's where Christians and Christ come together and have great wedding feast. It's like a heavenly party. And that's the church in heaven. And during the church uh, in heaven is going on in the, in the heaven, for seven years on earth, there is great tribulation. And that's uh, what I told you about those plagues, um, seven trumpets and seven seals and seven bowls, all those terrible things happening on earth. And after that time, Christ will return to the earth. And when he comes, he will come together with the church that have been raptured up. And he begins millennium kingdom for a thousand years. And during the time, the devil and the demons are locked away. So the world is going to be very different from what we know now. And people basically live moral and good life. Um, there's no presence of evil as it is now. But even that will come to an end after a thousand years, as the Bible tells us. And there's going to be the final rebellion and final judgment. Um, those people who have been kind of uninfluenced by sin because the demons and the devil are locked away, they are released for a little time and they are going to entice and tempt people to rebel against God and people will be against God and those um, who believe in God will come to God as, as, as people. So it will happen after the Millennium Kingdom and finally there will be the judgment that will divide the people who go to heaven and people who go to eternal hell. So that's basically what we know from the Bible um, as the, the events, the series of events, or the chronology of the end time events. We also looked at the resurrections. There are a few resurrections, and that's important because um, it can be confused about different kinds of resurrections. The first is the resurrection for believers, which will take place at rapture. Um, dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and those who are alive will be transformed and taken to heaven. Um, it's a little um, overwhelming for some of you, but that's what the Bible tells us. Um, and I hope I can explain to you in more detail some other time. But for now, just um, as a revision, uh, we'll have a look at this resurrection. So, and the resurrection of believers also takes place another, uh, one more time after the tribulation. And this is for the saints or Christians that are saved during the tribulation time. That they are saved after the rapture, so they basically have missed the resurrection, first resurrection, but they become part of the first resurrection after the short seven years because they will all, most, most of them all will die during the tribulation through um, persecution and martyrdom. But there's also another resurrection the Bible talks about, and this is the resurrection of unbelievers, and that will take place at the final judgment. And essentially, people will all be resurrected some will, some will resurrect or raised into everlasting life, as Jesus said, and some will be raised into everlasting damnation. So in essence, that's basically a summary of what we've seen in session one. But also, we saw that when it comes to human life, um, our life is somewhat very short. We looked at this verse. The days of our lives are 70 years. So if you are strong, if, the, if by reason of strength, they are 80 years. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, and for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Our life is so short, and we fly away. I was just talking to people who are in perhaps their 70s, um, 60s and 70s, and, and we talked about this today as well. Surely our days really fly away quickly don't they? And that's the Bible, that's what the Bible tells us. And all we really can say um, is about our labor and sorrow and all these terrible things that we've been through in our lives. But the Bible says also our life is finite. That's why also in the same psalm, the psalmist says, teach us the number, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. If you can, perhaps you can 
pan the camera to the screen when I have some images on the screen. It says, teach us to number our days. If you have a little time, this is a very simple mathematical exercise that you can do. Try to find out how many days you have lived and try to estimate how many days you might live in the future. All you have to do is just multiply 365 by the number of years that you have lived. And you'll find that if you live 70 years, you merely live 25,550 days. Perhaps, you know, take or add a few more days. But 25,000, maybe 30,000 days, that doesn't sound very much, does it? 840 months. Now, when we realize our life is not that long, we gain a heart of wisdom. When you actually calculate the number of hours that you have at your disposal, you realize suddenly that there's not much and you really cannot do a lot of things as you thought you would be able to. Same goes with our life. So when we realize that our life is finite, then how can we get the heart of wisdom? Well, we realize that our life is not forever. And therefore, we turn our eyes from this temporal, mortal world into eternal, heavenly kingdom. One thing that people have been pondering over the years is why is it that people, whether Christians or non-Christians, people in general, why is it that people in general always long for eternity? Have you noticed that? It's with um, any culture. If you look at any culture, they all have legends and stories of immortality. Stories of people living forever. Particularly, stories of people loving forever. You look at the songs, and many songs would have words to the effect of things like, you know, I love you forever, or I want to be with you forever. Why is it that people who can only live 70 to 80 years talk about eternity, living eternity, and loving it in eternity? It doesn't make sense, does it? We have, in other words, yearning for eternity. We have desire to live forever, even though we cannot, and we know it. The heart of wisdom takes us then from our human thoughts and human world to something that is external, to human. Because we have no answer inherently. We need to look outside of us and outside of our world. And the theologians talk about the fact that um, this truth is external to human world. It comes not from within or inherently or intrinsically from human beings, but it comes from outside. In that sense, this truth about eternal life is somehow alien. It comes from outside and into us, and we look up to heaven and to the Word of God to gain answers to those profound and fundamental questions. So we've done that in a sense. As we looked at our eschatology, we wanted to learn about eternity and how we can gain um, that eternal life. And before that, as we looked at personal eschatology, this is another slide that we saw last week, we realized that we are born into this world and we live a life that is so short and we, we come to death rather suddenly. And after that comes Judgment of God. And of course, judgment means some will go eternal heaven, some will go to eternal hell. As Jesus said, some as the sheep to everlasting life, some as the goat to everlasting damnation. That's basically what the Bible tells us about our eschatology, or personal eschatology. And you might think, now, then what is the standard? What makes people go to heaven and what makes people go to hell? Now, generally speaking, um, if, you spoke to, if you talk to people who are not Christians, they'll say things along the line of, well, if you're good, then you probably go to heaven. And if you're not really good, if you're really bad or evil, then you might go to hell. And of course, the question is then, what is the, the standard of good and evil? And how good do you have to be in order to go to heaven? Or how evil do you have to be to be sent into eternal hell. Now, you can have arbitrary, kind of very subjective uh, views on that, but that's not good enough because it's not us, 
It's not even the judge of the Supreme Court who will send me to heaven or hell. It's God. The judge for eternity or eternal heaven or hell is none other than the holy, righteous God. So you have to ask him. And of course, he has given us the answer through his book, the Bible. What does the Bible tell us about the standard for goodness or evil that sends people to heaven or hell? In fact, um, it's a little depressing, but as we saw last week, even though we didn't know it, we became sinners. Because the Bible essentially tells us that if you have any sin, any sin at all, then that's enough to send you to eternal hell. But as we saw also in Romans 5.12, just as one man brought sin into this world, and death came through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. It's almost as if that, that you know, we are born into this world without knowing with sin. Now how does that happen? You know, how, what does that mean? You know, why does the Bible say that? Isn't that too much? You know, we have all these questions, but we'll have a look at why that is the case. Now to start with, think about the stories in Genesis that I told you last week. In Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3, how sin came into this world. Adam and Eve, they were created by God. God made them to be perfect. They were created without sin at first. But they were given one command, just one command. Not to eat that fruit from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when God gave them this command, do not eat this. Because if you eat this fruit, eat this fruit God said, you will surely die. We saw that last week. But they ate the fruit. And she, Eve, gave it to her husband, Adam, and they also, he ate the fruit. They, all, they ended up eating the fruit, and they became mortal beings. We talked about also, during the table talk time, a little more ex extensively. But essentially, they became a dying being. They were created to live, but they became mortal. Um, they died physically, although it was many years after, but they, they also died spiritually straight away. They were severed from God. They were cut off from God and they could not commune with God or fellowship with God anymore because of sin. It's because essentially they listened to the lie of the devil instead of the truth of God. In fact, that's where all sin originates. Not listening to God's word and distrusting God, doubting God's word and not obeying his word. But instead, you listen to the lie, and the lie that originates from the devil, the devil who is the father of all lies, as Jesus said. And since then, as we can see on this um, chart in this verse in Romans 5.12, because of one man, Adam, all the people born into this world, and all these people who are born from beginning to the end, are born with sin. Let me show you this verse. This is a psalm, this is a psalm written by King David. And he said something very profound about sin and how sin comes to us. He said, Behold, I was brought forth, which means he was born into this world, in iniquity. And in sin my mother conceived me. Now he wasn't talking about whether his mother was doing something sinful when she conceived him. He's talking more theologically about the fact that from the moment he was conceived, he was conceived with and in sin. In other words, as NIV translates, he was born sinful, or he was sinful even at birth. You come to this old um, you know, argument. Uh, do humans, you know, human babies, uh, are they born with sin, or are they born with innocence, or are they born innocent or not innocent? The biblical answer is that they are born with sin. It is only that they are unable to do sinful things because they are so young. The moment they can speak, they will speak lies, even though they are not taught to speak lies. And the moment they can go and run and do things with their hands and feet, they will do things that are not necessarily good. 
Of course, they might do good things, but they also do naughty things. And if you've seen kids, then you know that's the truth. Where does it come from? It comes from within our heart, and our heart that is infected with sin. It's like this. I mean, uh, this is just illustration. It, it's like um, getting some infection, and parents might um, pass it down to their children, like some hereditary disease. Imagine this, you go to a doctor and say, doctor asks the question, um, after some diagnosis and um, listening to your heartbeat and, and doing some checks and uh, tests, the, the doctor asks you, so tell me about your family. Um, did your father have any particular disease or your mom have any particular disease? Or do you have this disease, this particular disease in your family, some extended family or you know, related people? And you tell them, yes, uh, my father or my, my mother or grandfather, someone had this disease. And you might discover that you have a hereditary disease. It's something that you're born with and you really have no choice. It's almost as if that we are born with the hereditary disease or virus of sin. That you're born with sin. Your, your sinful nature, which is basically essentially human nature, is, is that causes us to sin in our life. And David realized this. When he found himself in terrible sin of committing adultery and committing even murder, he prayed to God and said, Look, God, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And indeed, this is a confession that every person ought to make before God, that I am born in sin, and I was born with sinful nature. Of course, you might think, well then, because I am not responsible for that, can I blame my parents? Can I blame Adam and Eve? The Bible says also, as we saw in Romans 5, um, let me just flash that screen again. Look at this, he says, Yes, sin came through one man, but sin and death spread to all men, because all sinned. Yes, it comes from our ancestors, but you still have a choice. You still make decisions. You still do things intentionally. And some of them are sinful. So there's no escape. We are all guilty and responsible for our sins, for our actions, for our thoughts, for our words. Of course, David realized that. And he didn't say, look, I was brought forth in sin, in sin my mother conceived me. He didn't say things like, well, it's not my fault, it's my parents' fault or Adam and Eve's fault. He later on says in that very same psalm, please receive me and forgive me and cleanse my sins, cleanse my sins, he said. Because he knew that he made the conscious decision to do sinful things. And that's the same for all of us. Look at this little chart now you can see that I was born from my father and my father from grandfather and great-grandfather and you can go all the way back. And if you go all the way back, you come to the first man, Adam. We are all Adam's descendants. There's no one who came from outer space. There's no one who came from some other monkeys that have evolved into human beings. We came all from Adam. And we all inherited sin nature. So, our sin traces all the way back to Adam and just because, well just as Adam was sinful, we, we are also sinful. Well, Adam became sinners because, sinner because he committed sin, but we became sinners because we are born sinful from the beginning and that's what the Bible tells us. And therefore, it is very important to realize that we do not become sinners because we sin, but we sin because we are born as sinners. Often people think, well, I'm not a criminal because I haven't done anything criminal. I'm not in jail, so therefore I'm not a criminal. You become a criminal if you have done criminal actions. And therefore they also think, well, I haven't done anything particularly sinful, so I'm not a sinner. I mean, you go up to someone and say, are you a sinner? And they'll probably hesitate for, for a while. And, you know, if... Um, in common situation, they'll probably say, I'm, I'm not that sinful. You know, I, I don't think I'm a sinner. But the Bible tells otherwise that we are all sinners because we are born 
as sinners, and therefore we do sinful things. A simple illustration from the Bible in Matthew chapter 7. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, you're in the book of Matthew chapter 25. Put a bookmark in chapter 25, and let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. Just flick through the Bible several chapters backward, and you'll come to Matthew chapter 7. And let me read verse 19 and 20, Matthew 7. It says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Now, Jesus is saying that you, know, you, should, you, should, you shall know the trees by their fruits. In other words, if you bear sin fruit, then, then you're a sinner. Just as an apple tree bears apple fruit. So, he said... When you look at the fruit, you know what kind of tree it is. And where does the fruit come from? The fruit comes from the seed. The seed is the seed of sin that was passed down from Adam. So it's like this. You have a seed, and you have a tree, and you have fruit. If you have sin seed or seed of sin, you have a sinful tree, which is a sinner, and you have sinful fruit which are the sins that we do in our lives. It is consistent with what David said in Psalm 51. We are born as sinners and therefore we go on sinning. And also the Bible says in Romans 6.23a, the wages of sin is death. Now we talked about death last week. There are three kinds of death, remember? Physical death. Uh, there's also... Um, um, eternal death, condemnation before God. Um, let me actually flash you that slide as well. We had, what is death? Um, there is a physical death, which is a cessation of bodily life. You, you cease function physically and you, and you die. And then there's a spiritual death, which is alienation from God, to be separated from God. There's also eternal death, which is eternal punishment and banishment from God for eternity, eternal hell, judgment. So there are different kinds of death. Now when you look at this verse, the wages of sin is death. Of course, this death is eternal death, eternal hell. This is what you pay for because of your sin. And that comes from the word of God. And that's because, you know, if you think that that's a little too much, think about this. In Romans 3.10, it says, there's no one righteous. No one is righteous enough before God. If you want to be righteous and go to heaven, you need to be perfectly righteous. And we know that no one's perfectly righteous. We have already done sinful things. We have already thought sinful thoughts. We have already done many sinful things. And even if you live perfectly from now on, that's not going to cancel your past sins. Indeed, there is no one righteous before God. And you have to understand that because God is holy and righteous and perfectly just. If you imagine you've got, say, 100 people, and you line them up in the order of goodness. So on one hand, you've got the best moral person, and on the other hand, you've got the least moral person. You might have some criminal murderers or people who are in jails, maybe even those who are in death row sentence. But on the other hand, you've got all these people who are so good that they not only get into trouble with the law, but they have done some um, respectable things. People who give charity um, and do really wonderful things for the society and community and so on. And in between are all these people. And you can place yourself somewhere in that spectrum. And you might think, well, I think I belong closer to this person over here. And you might think, that, well, I'm not that you know, close to this far end, but you know, I surely you know, I would be somewhere in the middle. But we all fall somewhere in between. But that's, that, that's how we compare ourselves. If you introduce God, where would God stand? You know, God would be, you know, he would be way off that chart. I mean, and to compare him to human beings is not right to start with. The Bible says God is holy and just and righteous. If you look at the attributes of God, especially from the Old Testament where many people and psalmists sing about God's attributes, 
He is holy and just and righteous that he cannot tolerate even a hint of sin. He cannot even conceive anything sinful. He cannot even lie, as the Bible tells us. And God is that holy and just and perfect. And if you want to be accepted by God according to your own merit and your works, then that's the standard you have to meet. Of course, we know that no one can. No one can. In fact, the earlier that you realize, the better it is for you. There were people in Galatian church. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. It's the New Testament. Who, who thought this? Um, and they said some interesting things um, in Galatians chapter Let's turn to chapter 3 first. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now what is Paul saying? Paul says that even though there are many people, it doesn't matter how many, as many as there are who are of the works of the law, they are under the curse. In other words, if you try to keep the laws and build up your works, good works, you're not under the blessing of God, you're under the curse. Why? For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you put a kind of mental underline on your Bible, continue and all, that's exactly what it is. If you want to keep the law and be righteous before God, you have to continue to do that all the time without fail and you have to keep all the laws. Can anyone do that? The answer is no. We've already failed. Even if we can do this from now on, we have already failed in the past and nothing can change that. Look at chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. He says, you have become estranged or you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. If you want to be justified by keeping the law, then you already have failed and fallen from grace. So that's not going to work. Indeed, in God's eyes, this is how we appear before him. Look at Jeremiah 17. Now, we have to remember that God sees into our hearts. We look at outward appearances. God looks into our hearts. The heart that God sees, the heart that's mine, yours, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But I, the Lord God, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. In other words, I will judge every man, every woman, every person according to the ways and the thoughts and the fruit of the person's doings. And since our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked before God, of course, the result of that judgment is condemnation. And that is the word of God. Now when you look at these things about sin and judgment, natural response of many people is that um, they then want to stop doing sinful things and start doing good things. Now will that change anything? Not much. As I said, when it comes to uh, this matter of sin, you know, there's no way you, you can erase your sin in the past. People might try to do good works and give to God good deeds, but this is how they appear before God. We are like all unclean things. Unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Even our best works of righteousnesses are like filthy rags before God. We all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities 
like the wind have taken us away. And that's why if you try to find answers within yourself, you will not find any answer to this question. Now let's take a little step back and, and think about this in, in a bigger picture. We can see that the eschatology has to do with sin. Now you might wonder, you know, why do the end, why does the end have to you know, end in bad and terrible way? Why is the Bible telling us that the world will be destroyed and people die and all these terrible things concerning our eschatology? It is because of sin. Sin came in and death came to this world. Death came to every man. In a sense, death even came to this world. We all have the end, eschatology, and it's all kind of tragedy. And when we realize that, sin and death and judgment, and also find out that, that we have no answer from ourselves, we need to turn to God. We need to listen to what God has to say. And think about this. If God is omniscient, all-knowing, and if God is so wise as to be wise enough to create all these things in this world, then couldn't he have possibly thought about this and perhaps even dealt with this before? Of course he has. The Bible tells us that he has done this even before the foundation of this world. And you might think, well, how does that work? Um, now, we, we cannot comprehend fully about what God does. He is on a different level, and you know, we, we cannot understand everything other than what we have received from the Bible. So we just need to go back to the Bible and understand as God has given us his message through his written words. And the Bible tells us the answer to that question. In the end, we realize and confess to God, we have all sinned and we have fall short of the glory of God. So God, what do we do? What can we do? Let's um, shift the gear and think about the solution now from the Bible. So we know that death is, is coming for everyone. And beyond death is the judgment. And the result of judgment is condemnation. And there's no escape for anyone. Everybody's born sinful. Everybody is judged before God and destined to eternal hell. In fact, that is the default position that everybody is born into. And when we realize that that is the, the truth, we turn to God and seek what God has to say about that. The good news is that God actually you know, did something about this. Um, in fact, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says this, This is a faithful saying, and this is worthy of all acceptance. In, in other words, everybody should accept this, and that is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom... Paul said, I am chief. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Now what does that mean? If you wanted to save sinners, it is to save sinners who are destined to eternal hell. And you know that um, the wage of sin is death and therefore sinners are punished into eternal death. Then how could God, or how could Christ save them? This is the big question. In fact, that is the theme and the question throughout the Bible from the Old Testament all the way to the end of the New Testament, even beginning from Genesis. If you look at Genesis chapter 3, there's a story of, of that, saving sinners from eternal judgment and death. How did, how did God do that? Well, essentially, it is um, through death. If I give you the answer from the beginning, you can put it into this one sentence. Death can only, only be conquered by a greater death. Death cannot be conquered by medicine or health food or exercise, sorcery, magic, or any of those things. Death cannot be conquered by any other things but greater death. It's as if that 
death must be swallowed up by greater death and also the, the resurrection that comes after. And that's the story of Jesus' death and his resurrection. But keep that in mind and let's now think about this. So Christ Jesus came to this world to save sinners. How could he do this? How could he save people from their sins? Now look at this. In Luke chapter 1 verse 77, when Luke writes about Jesus' birth, this is how he came. Jesus came to give knowledge of salvation to save people from sin by the remission of their sins. In other words, to save people from sin and death and judgment, he had to remit or he had to do away with their sin. In other words, you can say, according to the words of John, he was manifested or he came to this world to take away our sins. He came to take away our sins and to remove our sins or to do away with our sin. And Christ came to do that. But before Christ came, he wanted to make it a little easier for people to accept and understand. So what he did with people of Israel was this. Now, when Christ came, there was something that John the Baptist said about Jesus Christ. He said, Behold, look at this, um, John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He said to Jesus, the Lamb of God. Now, why the Lamb? Now, for those of you who are familiar with the Bible language of Lamb and sacrifice, then you'd know what John is talking about. But um, for those of you who may not be so familiar with, uh, let me just give you a very brief rundown of what Lamb means or meant to the people of Israel at the time. Now, God said to the people of Israel, this is what you do to remind you how sin can be forgiven. Take lambs or goats at least once every year and some other times as well. But as a nation, they were told to take a lamb and kill the lamb and shed the blood of the lamb and take the blood into the temple of God. Why? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And it is the blood that atones the sin of the people. It is because um, the original sin of Adam, God said, if you eat this, you will surely die. So the price that he paid for was, was death. And to save people from sin and death, that price has to be paid. And that appeases God's justice. So without changing that, God said, yes, this is how your sin can be forgiven. But as a symbol only, for now, take animals and kill the animals. And through the death of the animals and, and the proof is by the blood, sprinkling of the blood, your sins can be forgiven. So every year, the Israelites would come around the tabernacle or temple. The tabernacle was the building, the tent that was actually built before the building, and the building, permanent building was the temple. They would come around the tabernacle, and then they would kill the animal, take the blood of the lamb into the, uh, into the tabernacle, and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, which is basically the, the, the covenant, the Ark of Covenant, um, that contains the Ten Commandments. And then God would forgive their sins. Now that ritual was carried out every year, every year, in a very solemn way. Because if anything went wrong, then the high priest that would, who would actually take the blood into the, the most holy place would be struck down, dead. He had to make sure meticulously that everything was right. The animal was taken from the good and clean and without blemish and without spot, wrinkle or any such thing. And, and that animal is to be killed in exactly prescribed manner. The blood is, is to be taken from the animal and taken to the most holy place only by the high priest, only once a year, and then sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant. And when God receives that offering, sacrifice offering, then their sins are forgiven, at least for that year, symbolically. Let me show you a little um, picture of that. So this is how God said sin could be forgiven. You first have to know your sin. That's why God told them about sin many, many times in the Old Testament. If you look at Leviticus and, and Numbers and Deuteronomy, it's full of the laws of God. And breaking all those laws or even any of those laws makes you sinful. 
So they knew their sin, and when you know your sin, then you bring the animal, animal sacrifice in front of this um, tabernacle. This is a little picture of the tabernacle. Uh, you've got all these um, things happening in the courtyard. The fire is, is there to burn the carcass of the animal, and the blood is taken and into the most holy place. So they kill the animal after laying their hands. When you lay your hands to the high priest, the sin of the people is transferred onto the animal symbolically. And then the animal is killed, so the animal dies instead of sinners. When they see the animal die, they realize, and, and they're reminded that that's how, should, that's how I should pay for my sins, by dying for my sin. And the blood is taken into the most holy place. So the blood offering is to redeem and to forgive sins. And this is how they used to do this every year. Every year they would sacrifice animals. And if you're wondering why there are so many killings in the Old Testament, killing of the animals, it's because of this. And so much so that some theologians said, if you wring out the Old Testament, you get the blood of the Lamb. If you also wring out the New Testament, you get the blood of Jesus Christ. So there's a connection. And if you think about that, that's um, sensible because look at this in verse 4 and 5, Hebrews chapter 10. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body, body of Christ, you have prepared for me. Christ came in perfectly human body. Because, think about this again, who committed sin? It's the people. Man, man or woman, human being. So you can't expect the animals to pay for the sin of human beings. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Then again, you might say, well, then why, why did they kill all these animals, bulls and goats and lambs, so many of them? As a reminder. As a reminder, and also to make them realize that sin is serious enough to render death, even though it was the death of the animal. And also as a sign as well, sign of the one who was to come. Christ, who would come as the Lamb of God. And therefore, when you go back to verses like this, remission of their sins, forgiveness of their sins, he came to give the knowledge of the salvation. How could that take place? Somehow, he had to pay the price for our sin by dying. And of course, that is the death on the cross. He shed his blood. He paid the price with his life. Some might say, how is that possible? How could one man pay for the sin of billions and billions of people in this world? Now that one man is not just one man, is he? He was born without sin. He was the Son of God. Indeed, he was God himself. He is far, far greater than all of us combined together. Even though it's all our sins, it is, it is far less than what Christ could bear as the Lamb of God, as the true Lamb of God. So really the number is, is irrelevant. Christ came, that one man, and took all our sins. He came to take away our sins. And when he took away our sins, he placed upon himself. And he died because of our sins. It is also logical because the Bible says through one man sin came into the world and just like that by one man we can be made righteous and justified. Romans 5, 18, 19. If you look at those verses it says through one man we became sinners and through one man we can become righteous and justified. So Christ came as the Lamb of God. In fact this was determined in God's mind. Look at this. Where does this come from? Which book? Revelation. Where is it in the Bible? It's the last book, isn't it? 
But even in the very last book in the Bible, it says Jesus was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. To borrow the words of Timothy or Titus and Timothy, it was Christ who died according to God's plan before time began. Before time began. Even before this world began. God ordained that he would come and die in our place. In fact, um, if you look at, um, let's look at Isaiah 53. This is something that we are very familiar with because we're going through the study. In verse 5, let, let's read it together from the screen. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's exactly what happened on the cross. As Christ was on the cross, he was bruised, he was chastised, he was beaten with whips, all because of our transgressions, our sins, to make us well, to give us peace, and to give us healing. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross. I mean, we all hear about that. Even non-Christians hear and know that Jesus came and died for sinners. But he came and died for me, who was born as a sinner. And when he died, he died for all my sin, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Bible says clearly that it is God who laid our sins on him. Not your prayer, not your asking, or not even minister's prayer for you or someone else's, but it is the Lord God who laid upon Jesus Christ all my sins. Let's look at this little um, diagram. So this is a kind of a summary. I'll give you a couple of slides like this. Now, we know that God is just. So he executes justice, that, that he should be on top. So God executes justice, but also his love. He's loving and his love is also just. And you can see that those two are contrary to one another. And because God is just, his justice is shown in his law. And the law says sin must be punished. So that's judgment. The law calls for judgment. Whereas God's love calls for his grace, and his grace desires salvation. And you can see that those are contrary to one another. If God decides one day, well, I am love and I am gracious, so I'll save people, whatever, um, I'll just say that I, you're, you're forgiven. That could happen, but that would violate his justice. God's justice is not fulfilled, and that's not right. I mean, that, that's not, that, shouldn't be, that shouldn't happen. So on the other hand, God might say, well, I am just and I am holy, so I can destroy them all because they're all sinners. sinners. And even if God did that, there's no problem with that. But then again, God's love is not fulfilled. His grace is not realized. So then, how did God achieve both? It was achieved and appeased on the cross because Jesus Christ took our place he was judged in our place instead and by that we can be saved if you look at the Bible there are many many laws now, this is helpful to understand this and many of the laws you know they are represented by say the Ten Commandments these Ten Commandments say things like you shall not worship any other God uh, I am the Lord God and I am the only God. Uh, keep the Sabbath and no idolatry, no stealing, no murder. You know, you should respect and honor your parents. Uh, do not steal. Um, you know, do not commit adultery. You know, all those laws, you know, do not covet. And then there are about 613 kinds of laws and tens of thousands of different kinds of laws that abstract from that. Basically, that tells them, people, Israelites and us, some um, to do certain things and to not to do certain things. You can say that they are moral codes or even spiritual laws, spiritually uh, things that, that, you know, that are regarded as sinful if you break these laws. 
But on the other hand, there's another kind of law in the Bible, and this is the, the law to do with redemption. And they are separate branch of law. You know, even in this world, there are different branches of law. You can, you, know, you can have the criminal law, you have the civil law, you have the family law, all these different kinds of laws. In God's law, there are also these laws that are indicting, indicting, indict, indict, indictive, um, if that's the word, uh, indicting law, which makes people guilty of their sin and their crime. But there are also laws that tell us how those sins could be forgiven. And these are the law of redemption. And that's basically what I told you about sacrificial animals. This is how you shall atone for your sins by taking the animal and killing the animal and shedding the blood. That's another law. And according to that law of redemption, Christ came and died. And in that law of redemption, you find grace. Yes, the sinner has to die. But God, by his grace and mercy, allows someone else to die in place of sinners. And that's also the law of God. And since there is no one who can take our place, God, you can say that God himself came down as man to take our place and to die perfect death to pay the price for our sins. If Christ had any sin, as some heretics espouse, then he could not have died for our sins. If he died and had sin, he was dying only for himself. So he had to come without any sin. In him, there is no sin. When he came and died, therefore he paid the perfect price for our sin. And so perfect, the Bible says, it was eternally paid. We'll have a look at um, Hebrews. This is... Um, very important verse. So let's turn to Hebrews. Uh, I'd like you to see from your own Bibles. Chapter 9, verse 12. Hebrews 9. It's verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he enter the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. His death was so perfect that it obtained eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. What is eternal redemption? This chart might help you. Now this is the timeline. And Christ came about 2,000 years ago. And he said when he died on the cross, it is finished. It is accomplished. What's finished? He finished the work of cleansing Sins, in particular cleansing my sins. That's important, isn't it? You must include yourself. You can say our sins, but it has to be my sins as well. So Christ cleansed my sins. Beginning from Adam, the first man, and those people who lived in the Old Testament times, they killed the lambs and they were looking forward to the coming of Christ. They were given the promise that he would come as the lamb. As for us, we look from our time into the past and saw that Christ who completed the work of eternal redemption. Now, eternal means eternal. That includes from eternity to eternity. And all of our time is basically encapsulated in eternity. Christ completed eternal redemption. In the Old Testament times, they were looking forward to the coming of Christ. Of course, they are in this eternal redemption. And in the New Testament times, people looked behind into the past and saw or see Christ who was on the cross. And they are also in this eternity. And this is where we are. We are living in our time. We have lived some time already and we will live some time even into the future. And all my sins that I have done, even the sins into eternity, the end of the world, are all included in the eternal redemption. And that has to be the case because if Christ only died for the sins up until the point of his death, then he has to come and die again and again and again, like the Old Testament sacrificial animals. And Hebrews writer says you know, he would have had to die often 
from the foundation of the world until the end of the world, but that's not the case because he died one death and that's eternal redemption and it is enough for all people and for all time. And therefore, John says in 1 John 2, 2, he, Christ himself, is the propitiation. Now that word simply means peace offering. Offering like the animal offering for our sins. And not only for ours only, but also for the whole world. Whole world. For the people who would believe. Not only for the Jews and not only for the people who are receiving this letter in John's days, but also it is for us. For us. So when Christ came and finished the work of eternal redemption, he said it is finished it is accomplished and that's why John when he saw Jesus Christ again this verse he saw the Lamb of God the Lamb of God referring to Christ now let's return to Matthew 25 and try to um, draw all this into a kind of conclusion now once you understand that this story becomes very easy to understand it's not hard it's very straightforward verse 31 when the Son of Man comes in the glory, in His glory. Now, when is He coming in His glory? Now, let me put this slide back up here again. Now, this is the timeline. When does Christ come in glory? Now, this is when He comes in glory and judging them. This is when He's judging them. Some to everlasting life and some to everlasting hell. So that has to be even after the Millennium Kingdom. When there is the final judgment taking place. As we read in Revelation chapter 20. So, again, Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And sheep and goats are very different from each other, right? So you can divide them rather easily. And shepherd does that. And he will set the sheep on the right hand side, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those he's on his right hand, King Jesus, come, you blessed of the Father, of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from when? From the foundation of the world. And then he says, I was hungry and you fed me and, and so on. And they say, when did you do that? Jesus said, if you've done these to one of these little ones, these brethren, this is what you've done to me. Now, if you also know the, the um, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, this makes a lot more sense. Whatever you do to a fellow brother in Christ or sister in Christ, fellow Christian, that's essentially what you do to Christ because Christ lives in that person. Whatever you say, whatever you do, even a glass of cold water, you will never lose your reward, Jesus said. And you do that because you're saved and you're placed in the church with our fellow believers. So they are ushered into the kingdom of God, prepared from before the foundation of the world. But on the other hand, in verse 41, he will say to those on the left, left hand, he says, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, originally hell was created for the devil, Satan and his angels, but these people who follow after the devil and not God have no other place but this place of hell to go, to be sent to. And he says, I was hungry, you did not feed me, and so on. And they said, we, when, we, when didn't we do that? And Jesus said, if you haven't done any of these to any of these little ones, then you haven't done that to me. In other words, these are not saved and therefore they are not in the assembly of holy people of God. In other words, they are not in the true church of God. They may be in the churches physically, but if they are not true Christians, then they are not part of the true church and they cannot, in, in truth, do these things to true believers and therefore they have not done any of these things to the Lord. It is because they are not saved and therefore they would be condemned into eternal hell. And verse 46, he says, These will go away into everlasting punishment, eternal tragedy. But the righteous, not because they are righteous, because of their righteous deeds, but because of the righteousness of Christ. We cannot earn heaven with our righteousness. We can only go to heaven 
by the righteousness of Christ. So because of his, what the theologians call, imputed or, or righteousness that has been placed upon or into us, imputed righteousness, we can be taken into the eternal life and eternal heaven. So, but the righteous into eternal life, eternal happy ending. So there you have it, eternal tragedy versus eternal happy ending. So when you look at this end or ending and how it will all come to an end, where does that place place us? And what about each, each one of us? Now just as we saw, we will go through cosmic eschatology. In fact, um, we know that we all live forever, either in heaven or hell. So in a sense, you know, we will all go through that some way. But also what's more imminent, imminent to all of us is our personal eschatology. I was even thinking about this just um, yesterday as I was um, reading some news of people who die tragically. And things can happen just um, in split seconds and the living is dead within a few seconds. Things like that happen. Death is not that far away. It's just around the corner for everybody, really. A healthy person can contract some disease and die all of a sudden. So when you know that your eschatology is imminent, then we gain a heart of wisdom. Not just heart of wisdom to make more money in this world and to live healthy in this world, but to gain a heart of wisdom for our eternal welfare. And then you look at words in the Bible about sin and the judgment and realize that you're under the condemnation. And that brings the heart of repentance and you repent before God and cry out to God, then God, what can I do? Can you save me? Of course, the answer that we've seen from the Bible is, I, I can. Not only that, he would say, well, I have done everything necessary for your salvation. When did Christ die? 2,000 years ago. The Bible was written as a complete book shortly afterwards. It's always been there. And God says, I've done everything. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? With repentance and faith and by His grace, we are saved. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, let me read those verses. Precious, precious jewel in the Bible. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Listen to this. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, by believing. And that it is not of yourselves. It's not something that you have earned or worked for. It is the gift of God. Have you received the gift? You just receive gift. You don't pay money for gift. You receive gift. It is given to you for free, no matter how costly it is. Our salvation, although it is given freely to anyone who would believe, was very costly because God paid the price with the life of his own dear son. And he says, it is not of our works, lest anyone should boast. No one can boast. So by his grace, and only through our faith, we are saved. And that's why the reformers used to say, sola fide, only faith. And sola gracia, only by grace. And solus Christus, only through Christ can one be saved. Even Jesus himself said, no one can come to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That's the one whom we believe. And that's the one who has saved us, no other Savior. There has been no other name given among men under heaven by which you must be saved, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, only through Christ. And that, that's why there's no salvation in other 
religions. And all these religions are man-made religions where people try to come, come to God. The Bible is God speaking to us. It is, it is God saying to us. It is God giving us the way to heaven. And that's the only way to salvation. Well, I'm sure um, we can talk more about this during our table talk. Um, but this is the gospel. And there's a lot more that we can talk about this. And I hope to share more of that, um, you know, many other opportunities when we have. Um, but the time um, is, is up for today. So let's pray and um, continue our worship as, our, as we share our food and, and fellowship with each other. Let's all pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for